It doesn't matter if you grew up in this generation or the last, or the one before that. You had parents who made sure you could ride a bike. It's just one of those skills that we as humans decided is necessary to learn. Between you and me, I think it's because subconsciously, we all recognize that an event like a coronal mass ejection could shut down the entire power grid, causing trains and gasoline pumps to stop working. So, what's the most efficient way to scavenge for supplies then? Exactly. And once people start biting each other's face off over canned peaches, your two-wheeled friend will be the fastest way out of the city. Alright, back to the topic. For many of us, the appeal of cycling declines as we age and favour more practical and fancier modes of transportation. This is especially true for folks living in developed cities with extensive railways and roads, like Singapore. For a long time, Singapore ignored the bicycle in its quest to upgrade its infrastructure to support the logistical demands of a modern, globalised economy. Even today, most pavements are just wide enough for two people to walk alongside each other. Don't even get me started on the roads, which have no dedicated bicycle lanes. Things are beginning to turn a corner, thanks to policies emphasising outdoor physical activities over 300 kilometers of shared paths have been paved for bicycles, walkers, and other scum. These network paths, called park connectors, do more than what their name implies. They are also often situated next to greenery and water channels. Aside from the PCN, one can also find several cycling paths popping up in different neighborhoods to make cycling a viable short distance travel option, rather than simply a recreational activity. But cycling paths are only as useful as the number of bikes on them. And if you cycle infrequently, chances are you don't own a bicycle, or the one you own is so old it's a candidate for UNESCO's heritage site. Either way, you might not be tempted to acquire a new bike because, let's face it, there are easier ways to get around the island, and there are other forms of exercise that might appeal to you more. Plus, bicycles need to be maintained, and storing it away can be annoying. So, how does a nation that has spent millions of dollars on shared paths encourage its people to rediscover the joys of the manual two-wheeler? Why, you take the hassle of owning a bicycle out of the equation. This leads us to the government-enabled bike-sharing movement that has, for better or worse, flooded the streets with tens of thousands of dockless bicycles. Back in early 2017, when these rentable bikes first arrived, just about everybody cheered. This was the kind of marriage between technology and lifestyle that would fit right in Singapore's future. The concept is sound. With the aid of a smartphone, you can locate a dockless bike nearby and unlock it for use at a fairly low rate. Returning it is just as easy. No need to physically lock the bike to a rack and worry about physical keys. But soon after these dockless bikes launched, there were issues. Issues which, on hindsight, we should have seen coming. The bikes were littered everywhere. They were strategically placed on footpaths to create obstacle causes for pedestrians. Thoughtful riders used them to brace trees so the giant plants wouldn't fall and crush innocent children should they be struck by lightning. Others were nice enough to test the integrity of these bikes by dropping them from height. As more time passed, people started falling in love with these bikes and didn't want to share them anymore. Some resorted to keeping them at home so they could have their way with them whenever they wanted to. Those who were ashamed to keep them at home would chain up their favourite dockless bike somewhere nearby with their own lock or remove the seat so these bikes would only ride for them. Now, it's not uncommon to have problems when new technology is rolled out to the masses without sufficient warning. In fact, that's what we've come to expect in this city where policymakers are all too eager to make Singaporeans guinea pigs for e-commerce. Thankfully, 
changes are afoot. Bike sharing companies and individual users now have to ensure that bikes are parked within designated spaces or risk fines and bans. Regulators have also reduced each company's fleet of bikes until they can prove that they are able to effectively manage their new, smaller fleet. These new regulations have caused several players to drop out of the Singapore market altogether, not all by choice. This is hardly a surprise, and while government officials, internet chatter and sensational media headlines have made it clear that our anger should be directed at bike-sharing companies, what have they actually done that's uncorporate like They exploited every grey area in their licensing agreement, they brought in as many bikes as possible to grab market share, and when their VC funds started drying up, they redirected revenue away from failing branches of their business. Why would we think for one second that new startups would prioritize the well-being of the Singapore people over their own survival. Don't forget who's actually in control of the situation. Don't forget who greenlit this whole thing in the first place. Every good and bad thing that happened from bike sharing happened under their purview. At no point in this debacle has the big G taken its white gloved hands off the handlebars now we are at somewhat of an impasse. Users are complaining of insufficient bikes and higher rental prices, while bike companies moan about their reduced fleet size and increased operational costs needed to adhere to new regulations. In all of this, eager pundits have chimed in with advice on how companies can restructure their businesses and cooperate better with regulators and customers but there seems to be little interest in figuring out if large-scale dockless bike sharing is a net positive for society in the first place. Sure, it's convenient, but so is wearing an adult diaper. Most of us avoid wearing one if we can, because we understand that being human involves some level of effort and responsibility. If we let technology displace every inconvenience, do we eventually just become batteries in the matrix? This whole trying to make society as comfortable and convenient as possible is going to backfire one day. We should be appalled that no one's talking about the environmental impact of this business, despite many photos of dockless bike graveyards floating around. Think about the raw materials and pollution required to make these short-lived dockless bikes. And what happens to them when they get battered beyond repair? Do they get recycled, repurposed, or go straight to the incineration plant and landfills, where they continue to add to the carbon emissions they're supposed to offset? And then there's the issue of how much public infrastructure should be utilised by private companies before it becomes a burden on society. There's no question that the accessibility of dockless bike sharing has reminded many of the fun of cycling and convinced some to ditch gasoline-powered transportation altogether. But maybe it's an interim solution to Singapore's car light future. Perhaps what we should be aiming for is something akin to what the Dutch are doing. Yes, a few dockless bike-sharing companies have also struck unholy unions with Amsterdam's city officials. The difference is, in Amsterdam, rentable bikes are mainly for tourists. Their biking culture is so prevalent that, as of 2017, 68% of traffic to and from work or school is by bicycle, and bicycles make up 36% of all traffic in the Dutch capital. In other words, most bikes zipping along the streets of Amsterdam belong to people, which means bikes are cared for, stowed away in designated spaces, and cycling etiquette is observed. If cycling is going to be a significant part of a city's culture, it must be sustained by the people's shared responsibility towards cycling. Government and corporate intervention can only take you so far. Bike sharing is a great way to jumpstart a cycling culture, 
as Singapore has proven. But in the long term, it only creates more of what Singapore already has plenty of. Unhappy customers, albeit customers with strong legs. Bike sharing turns a simple joy into a recurring paid service that users will never be satisfied with because their expectations are constantly butting up against the need for profit. Now that cycling is seeing a resurgence, policymakers should spend their time continuing to grow interest in cycling rather than regulate the business of cycling. Organize more family-friendly cycling events, offer rewards for riding regularly, and give discounts to citizens purchasing new bicycles, similar to what the Health Promotion Board has done to encourage an active lifestyle. And of course, continue to adapt and upgrade public infrastructure to make cycling a viable commuting option. Dockless bike sharing can continue to exist on a small scale for tourists. But if the goal is to create a nation of happy peddlers, more bike ownership should be on the cards. The big G goes to great lengths to make houses relatively affordable, even for those earning a modest income, because they believe that when citizens own their homes, they are more invested in the country's development. Well, more bike owners won't just raise cycling's popularity. It will create more environmentally conscious and healthier people who want to do their part to keep the local cycling community thriving. Is that not a culture worth striving for? Besides, unlike buying a house, a bike doesn't require you to pay it off by doing the same thing for 20 years. Other than being a small investment, bikes are also durable require little upkeep, and there's not much more you need to spend after the initial purchase aside from a decent lock and a couple of lights. Your bicycle will pay for itself if you ride it regularly. Yes, you can't just leave your bike in the open, but maybe that's a small price to pay for a transportation device that lets you escape from the apocalypse. Set coffee, out. Thank you.